This is the English Suite Podcast. My name is Gabby Norris, and I created the concept for this episode, as well as conducted most of the interviews. I was inspired as an English major myself to put together a podcast episode showcasing all of the ways in which English majors prove to be successful in their career fields following graduation. And no, we do not all become professors. In publishing this episode, I hope to encourage a younger generation to pursue their passion for literature, feel confident in it, and know that the stereotypes hold no truth. In this episode, we are featuring alumni Taylor Blum and Josh Schneider, in addition to faculty member Christine Woody and current student Ashley Serrano. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you are as inspired by these special guests as I am. I'm Taylor Blum, uh, Widener class 2018. I was a double English and creative writing major. While at Widener, I was an editor for Widener Inc. for all four years. And during my sophomore year, I was editor in chief. And then I had some other time with the Blue Root and things like that at Widener. I also did theater, Lone Brick Theater Company. I think it's still going strong. And then after I graduated Widener, I went to Rowan and I got my MA in writing. I just graduated with that last May, 2021. And while I was doing grad school, I taught English uh, composition courses at Rowan. So been all over that. I've had many different lives is what I like to say. (laughs) Cause now my current job is very different from all of that. So I am gonna jump right into the first question I have, kind of the, the big fish. What myths have you heard about pursuing an English degree and or any backlash you might've received for what you chose to major in. Yeah, you know how when people graduate, they decorate their graduation caps and they put phrases on it. My phrase was, so what are you gonna do with that? Because that is what I always heard whenever, that was the common myth, you know, oh, I'm going to be an English major in creative writing. Okay, well, what do you do with that? Well, really you do a lot with that. The skills that you gain from being an English major, from doing creative writing, is important, it's imperative, it's kind of ingrained into most career paths, because everyone needs to know how to communicate, no matter what your job is. If you work in a science lab, you still need to communicate the reports and the test studies. And of course, if you are in um, like healthcare, anything really, you always need to communicate it's kind of, it was always frustrating for me when I really started to get into it because the skills that you learn from that is you analyze material, you learn critical thinking, and you learn how to shape and craft arguments. That's all a part of communication. So that was always a a big thing. That was a big myth that I always heard. My name is Josh Schneider. I graduated in the class of 2017. Of course, uh, I was an English major and I'm currently pursuing my master's and shopping around for PhDs in urban education. I come from a family of scientists. My brother is a pharmacist. My mother was pre-med before having children, and then she is now a science professor. Initially, the myths I'd heard, right, were the same standard myths that I think most of us have become familiar with in the past few years of anybody pursuing humanities is, you know, the job market isn't there, the degree doesn't do anything helpful, and I was really anxious to tell my mom I was switching majors. And when I did tell her I wanted to switch majors, uh, originally I'd gone to Widener for a biology degree, we had to actually sit down and have a conversation and have me show her like, hey, these are possible job fields I could enter. Um, Here's like what the pay looks like. Here's the perspective growth of these fields in order for her to actually feel comfortable with me making that change. She definitely had hopes originally when we were all going away for school that she would be nurturing a family of scientists. She's a scientist. She loves science. She wanted all of us to be pharmacists or doctors or engineers. Interesting. So she was looking out for you. You just didn't necessarily get any direct backlash for it. Was she eventually okay with the choice? Um, 
yeah, I eventually got her around on it on the premise of three things. One is one of my high school teachers is friends with her and was an English teacher and sort of defended my decision to switch majors and was saying, hey, like Josh will find work. That myth is not nearly as callous as everybody says it is. Um, And the other big one was just at the end of the day, I do have a very supportive family and she wanted me to find my joy in higher education. And the way that was going to happen was reading books with all the lovely professors at Widener. I'm Christine Woody. I am a professor in the English department at Widener, and I run a textual scholarship certificate program there. I did an English degree from McGill University in 2007. um, And after that, I went on to do an interdisciplinary degree in humanities and social thought from NYU, and then a PhD at uh, the University of Pennsylvania. What myths have you heard about the English slash creative writing major um, and what backlash have you faced for it, if any? Oh, that's really interesting. Um, so I would say the first myth about the English major is that it's the same kind of thing as an English class in high school. And I will confess that when I went to undergrad, I labored under this myth as well. Um, and so it actually took me till the spring of my first year to take an English class. Um, I mean, I'm always someone who, you know, I've loved literature my whole life and loved reading. Um, but I think my English classes in high school, I maybe felt that we didn't always get to talk about the texts in the way that I had wanted to, um, or that the goals of the class were not in, invested in the direction that I had wanted to go. Um, and so that made me not particularly like motivated towards taking an English class right away when I got to to university. I took classes and disciplines I'd sort of never had the opportunity to explore before, like, you know, psychology and sociology and political science. But then I took an English class in the the spring of my first year, and I discovered that the, the methods and the ways of approaching literature were just completely different than what I thought it was going to be. And so for me, there were sort of, you know, a few things that sort of unlocked. One was the idea that we would use theories to understand literature. And so I was doing this uh, one class and we read Sir Gowan and the Green Knight, which is probably a text that you've read if you've done English 133, Um, but it's a medieval uh, romance and um, in one of these Arthurian night tales. And uh, we were using some of um, the theories of props morphology of the folk tale to stop, to talk about it. And all of a sudden it was like, Oh, there's this amazing toolkit of ways of unlocking literature. And when you use different tools, you get different answers. And all of a sudden it felt like this is not a circumstance where we're all just going to sort of react or just analyze the plot and move on. But instead it was like, we can make this text do and say exciting things. Um, It becomes kind of a puzzle. And so that was one really amazing moment for me. And I think what, what finally sold me on becoming an English major was actually a class the following fall. And the prof used to make us write every week these response papers. They had to be one page and she would give you either, you know, an X if it was terrible or a check if you did the paper or a check plus if you had done something, you know, incredible. And we used to try to covet this check plus. I couldn't figure out how to get a check plus out of her, but she would occasionally let us read together and discuss together one of the check plus papers from the group. Um, And we were talking about a Jane Austen novel called Emma. And there's a scene in the novel where characters are debating who to invite to a party they're trying to host. And if the house is big enough to host all these people. And depending on the cultural status of who they're inviting or the social status, I should say, they are deciding that they can fit more or less people in the room. Right. So that basically, if they're just inviting, they're kind of on the fringes of the the, the upper class, the set of characters. And so if they're only inviting their closest friends, they can pack like 20 people at the table, no problem. But if they're going to invite Emma and her father, who are the sort of social pinnacle of their little town, then we have to have way more space. We can't pack everybody in. And so anyway, this is not something I had noticed from this scene, but we got to read one of my classmates analysis that that did this magic trick of making you realize that like this room that had not changed in size was like growing and shrinking based on which characters were in it and it was like 
this was the moment that for me, I sort of went, wow, literary analysis is this, it's a way of changing forever the way someone relates to a particular scene or moment or like aesthetic experience. And, and for me that I will never not think of that reading when I reread Emma. Um, and this has happened to me since with so many different texts and so many different parts of life. Um, and, and so for me, there's just this incredible richness and um, impact of what we do when we talk about literature. Um, that's a really long-winded way of getting from your previous question, which is, you know, what are the myths? And I think the one myth is that, you know, we're just going to read a story and summarize it. And it's like, no, we're going to do so, so much more than that. We had such a similar experience with finally switching to English. It was Castaldo that poached me from nursing in her close reading of Hamlet. I had a very similar experience looking at this text that seemed like, you know, just like boring old people speak, <laughs> like very old timey language, like yada yada. But then she was like, read it, read it closely. Don't don't take a page. Don't even take a stanza. Take this first line and then take that first word. You read through it and you realize it has two meanings. And I swear, I left that first class completely, completely changed. And from that point on, I was an English major. We talk about it in these terms, but I, I do think it, that there is something kind of like worlds open when you can right. lean on language and mm -hmm. make language yield up its complexity to you. Right. Um, and that the, there are so many times in life where we go through life you know, and we need to deal with surfaces because we need to be efficient and we need to get things done. And, and one of the mm -hmm. gifts I would say of the English major is, is the, the opportunity to dwell and the opportunity to go below the surface that you don't necessarily get in other fields. Hi, my name is Ashley Serrano. I am a nursing major with a minor in creative writing. Um, I am currently taking poetry right now for my creative writing class. Welcome to the English Suite. I, I, I had you, I think, in English 102. It was a short fiction class like last yeah. year. And you were a really good student. Um, always appreciated your participation in class. I was really happy to hear when you picked up a creative writing minor. So what, what myths about English and creative writing have you heard as a student? This is horrible, but sometimes when people pick up an English or arts major, it's because they're not smart enough or good enough to do another major, or they don't have the motivation to put in the work for something quote unquote harder. Is there any truth to that? Not at all. I don't think it's true at all. You know, for writing, you still have to put in a lot of work. You have to put a lot of thought behind it. You have to make it make sense. You have to make it convincing for others. You have to make it um, have feeling, even though it's just words. It's definitely still a lot of hard work. I know I feel so passionately about debunking these myths, but I can't help but wonder what if at least one of them is true. Yeah, I mean, I think, again, it, it, those myths are maybe true to people who, I mean, this is going to sound bad, but like don't put in the effort. Uh, mm -hmm. I think either, it, it depends how, mu how much, how hard you work and the areas that you want to get get into and what you actually want to do that. It comes down to the individual. It's not a problem of the major. It's a problem of individual I guess which makes me sound really terrible I think but um I'm always I I like to work hard I guess thanks uh, but I also have constant imposter syndrome so I think that's I think now that's a myth that's true about English majors they're all have imposter syndrome but it's true so after choosing English switching over and starting this new path at Widener did you experience any regrets or doubts about making the switch Honestly, probably one or two. I, I guess the first doubt would have been I was also in a fraternity at Widener, a bunch of young adults all together in that STEM mindset that everybody's been ingrained with for the past few decades. And there was a lot of laughter at the fact that I was making this change to English. So there were some initial doubts, but once everybody started asking me if I could like review their papers and give them any feedback or things like that, the tables kind of turned a little bit for me personally, like the, in the internal uh, strife was gone. I was, I was kind of validated. Um, and I'd say, honestly, my only regret is I pretty much jumped 
completely out of science and I probably would have liked to have taken a few more classes in science with hindsight only because um, I also have interest in physics and things like that. Um, English major regrets is not taking enough poetry classes or technical writing classes. That's true. I actually had no interest in poetry before coming to Widener. And then I had two poetry classes back to back just to fulfill requirements. It wasn't like my choice. I fell in love with it faster than you could say iambic pentameter. It was awesome. Yeah, I think I only ended up taking maybe one or two poetry classes, which is hilarious <laughs> because I think most of what I write nowadays is poetry. A lot of what I read nowadays is poetry, especially some of my students might hate it a little bit, but I do subject them to poetry because I think it's an important art form. It's an important medium to work through. When you yourself kind of, when you were thinking about minoring in creative writing, what's the story behind that? Like, how did you get interested in it? And I've always enjoyed writing. I would write in my free time, but then when I got to college, I found it to be more expressive and it was just more fun, I think, because I didn't have a lot more responsibilities, I think. I think that the professors I had definitely had an impact on it. They definitely geared me towards writing what I wanted to write rather than just those boring high school assignments that basically had no impact on me whatsoever. I had more freedom and I found myself enjoying it way more and I had a lot more inspiration. So I was writing more often and you know, people were just telling me that I should take up the minor, that I was doing really well in it. And I think I really wanted to do it. So I did. Great. And we're glad to have you in, in that program. Did you read any kind of resistance? Like when you would either tell family or friends, hey, I'm thinking about minoring and creative writing. Were, were you getting dirty looks? Were you getting like eye rolls? Were, you, were people pushing back on it at all? I'm just curious whether you got any flack for that. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, like I knew that I wanted to do it, but I think I just was looking for someone to tell me to do it as well. So when I went to, for example, my brother, who is super supportive now, he kind of said, why? You know, what is it going to do for your major? Like writing, just do that on your own time. Why do you need to minor in it? And I, I don't know. I think that kind of discouraged me for a bit, even though I was fighting him. I tried reasoning with him, you know, this is just something that I want to do and I want to get better at it. And I think that, you know, taking a minor would help me. And then when I told my mother about it, she goes, what is just going to distract you? You know, oh my God, are you going to stop being a nursing major? Are you going to go into writing? How are you going to get any money? And I, you know, it kind of sucks, but they're super supportive now. But yeah, that's kind of what I was met with. I imagine a lot of students face like very similar um, responses from family members in that case. Obviously you sort of dug in your heels and you just said, I'm yeah. still going to do this. So where did you find the strength to kind of stand your ground? I think that the happiness that I was feeling when I was writing sort of helped me. You know, I knew that I was way more happy taking these writing classes and I wanted to pursue it, especially because I knew that I was going to take short story later on. And that's so cool because I've always wanted to improve my short story writing. And as well as poetry, you know, just seeing that I would have to take those classes kind of pushed me to do it. And I didn't care what anybody else was telling me. I was like, I'm going to do it. I don't care. I'm curious. I know I received a lot of hate about my major from my family. How, how were your relatives with the whole English degree? Were they supportive or did they push back a little bit? Um, my family is very supportive for it. I, Ever since I was a young kid, I always wanted to write and I always wrote stories. In third grade, we had these projects where we could write books and I made a whole little series about a cat that could fly and fight crime. <laughs> um, so that was something that I was always into. My, my parents were very supportive about following that because they knew that I was passionate about it and that I worked hard. I think maybe they were also a bit unsure about where I would end up job-wise um, I know for a while I wanted to be an editor and then I started teaching and now I do more technical and marketing work. But Wider once had um, at the uh, Humanities Honors Award Ceremony at the end of the year, they had a guest speaker 
And one year he talked a lot about, um, you know, just someone gives you a chance. And that's true for any job throughout interviewing. You just need someone to give you a chance. And no matter what your background is, you have that experience and it'll put you somewhere. So I think my parents were pretty, they were okay. They, they knew that I would do what I needed to do to land on my feet. I love that. I'm really happy to hear that you had a somewhat better experience than I did. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I know parents, they try to discourage you. It might come up harsh, but I, I hear the, we're just looking out for you thing a lot. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that was true or not, but it was still super discouraging to hear that my mom didn't even approve of what I wanted to do with my life. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's definitely a big part of deciding, well, if this makes me happy and I know I can do something with it rather than going in some field, you work in that field for 10 years and you realize you hate it and then you need to start all over. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, Because I do have some friends who are in that boat and it's, it's hard for them trying to figure mm-hmm. out, well, what are they going to do now? Yeah, it's the same for me. I know a girl in my grade and I actually know a senior who both decided to major in nursing and neither of them feel confident that they want to keep mm-hmm. pursuing it, but it's also too late to backtrack. Yeah. So that's, kind of, um, that's definitely a degree where it's, it's, you, you really get into it and then it's a little bit too late. Um, yeah. I, I definitely, I know a few people who really, they're trying to make career changes and it's, it's not always easy, but I mean, I think if you're still in college, you have that chance. My brother, for example, um, he started as a 3D animation major and he does, he's now a data analyst for inventory in like big warehouse companies. So it's, you know, it wasn't what he necessarily wanted to do. And then he found it, you know, took him a little longer to get where he wanted to be. You graduated with an English degree. What is your career currently? What career did you pursue? Fresh out of graduation, I really just kind of wanted to float around and see what it was like in the like contracted newspaper, like journalist space, effectively. Um, I ended up doing a few pieces for some New Jersey magazines and New Jersey newspapers just to see what that was like. And while I really enjoyed the process of going to a location, taking photos, talking with people, conducting interviews, writing an article. The other stuff, as it turns out, that goes into being like an independent contractor, the like selling yourself and dressing really nicely all the time. And just the the sheer amount of like emails that go out in any one day. That kind of thing wasn't for me simply because it's really hard for me to manage that sort of stuff. So then I started thinking about what else could I possibly get interested in? And I ended up finding work at a law firm. That job actually was super fulfilling for myself and was something that I really enjoyed. Only after about a year and a half there did I end at my current position. Currently, I'm a teacher at a high school. And as I said earlier, pursuing a master's and hopefully a PhD, if my bank account permits. Sometimes I've heard people say that, you know, you have these passions, right? And typically for us more creative types or artsy types, we have these passions that we think, oh, I can make, I, this is what I want to do. So I need to figure out how to make it a job. But sometimes there is the double-edged sword of, well, I really like graphic design. Um, and I want to, and I like art. I like drawing. So I want to make my, my full-time job. But then the problem is when you are sort of working for someone else, but doing those skills, then you lose, you don't have as much time for the emotional, mental effort to do it, what you, your passion projects and your spare time. So there definitely is a balance to that, of figuring out well, where do I want to go with this and how can I still keep alive the skills, the, the, my personal goals to then make it, you know, a livable life, <laughs> um, something that works for you. Uh, my current job it's very technical. It's, uh, I analyze legal documents and write reports for slip and fall lawsuits and based on engineering analysis. Uh, but I like to write fiction. So I have that balance of, well, I write for a job, but it's all, it's one part of my brain. So when I go home, I'm using the other part of my brain. So I still have that mental energy most times. So myth number two (laughs) in my mind is, Um, that all we ever do as English majors is read super long books and uh, really hard poems. And and it's funny because this is almost in some ways like, you know, I just made the hard sell for 
why we should read hard texts and enjoy them. Um, But it's not the only thing we do, right? Do I love spending the time like plowing through a 600 page novel and thinking about the complex way that that thing does portraiture of the world? Of course I do. Do I love a difficult poem and really thinking about this poem as a place where like meaning is contested? Of course I do. But there's so much more that we do. um, And there are things that people don't always think about when they're thinking about the English major. I, my research and my work is in the field of print culture. Um, so I'm not looking just at like the super literary, canonical, high art writing. The work that I do focuses on writing that appears as part of daily life. So I'm interested in magazines and newspapers and like literature that's considered junk literature, bad literature, minor genres, gossip, scandals, autobiography, all this kind of stuff. And so one of the ways when I talk about my own research and I'm trying to kind of explain it to people who don't care about, you know, 1802 in Britain is that I tell them that I'm looking at an analog version of social media. Um, Mm -hmm. And I'm really looking at a a whole world of sort of people speaking in public to other people, trying to build sort of personal brands and all this kind of stuff that goes on. And and to me, it's like, this is a fascinating way of thinking about where the literary falls, that the literary is not this rarefied thing that only happens in the right books written by the right people. It's actually this way of relating to the world that we do through all parts of our life. And one of the places that we find it instantiated a lot um, is in printed texts. And so that's one of the things I focus on. Um, And so it's something I try to bring into my teaching too, right? So when I think about how I teach a course like English 131 um, that we did together in the fall, um, there I really focus on genre, right? And saying like, what are these ways of writing um, that become threads through which we can engage with history and political and aesthetic developments and even questions of like human values or human needs, um, that those become sort of threads you can tug. And so for someone who's, who's not familiar with the term genre, we could think of something like fantasy or science fiction as a genre. And I think that's quite legible to us as, as that's, it's a set of texts that all have something in common. But in classes I teach, it'll be things like the epic or the gothic, right? And those are the historical genres that, that I'm interested in, although I always argue that they persist and influence us to this day. Um, so that's one, one piece. And then the other thing I would say, you know, that I think is, is at play in the, in the English major, especially at Widener, um, maybe even to a greater degree than it was when I was an English major, is thinking about all the other types of writing and types of activities that go into engaging with the literary um, that are beyond sort of reading and writing essays in response. And so I think about the the fabulous relationship between the creative writing department and um, the English department, we are one department, but the creative writing program and the English program, that there's this desire to think about that creative critical exercise where through creating, you can produce knowledge. Um, But also thinking about, you know, the class we're doing together right now on the theory and praxis of editing, where, um, you know, we're really thinking about how editing texts is engaging in scholarly activity, is engaging in analytical activity. And as we've even seen, sometimes making choices that that other readers find controversial about those texts, right? Um, And so that's another piece that I would say people don't maybe expect that out of the English major, um, that you're going to do more than the sort of read the long books and write difficult papers. I think you'll do some of that, but you'll do also all kinds of other avenues of approach to think about this question of what is literary writing and why is it valuable and interesting? Absolutely. Um, but I'll tell you one more if, you're, if, you're, if you've got time. Mm-hmm. And um, my last myth that I was thinking about was the myth that all English majors become teachers. Um, yeah. And I realized that Again, I'm sitting here and indeed a large part of my job is teaching. And for me, the teaching, you know, I I love doing it. It makes me a quicker thinker. It makes me a better scholar. And indeed, there are ways in which, you know, Widener undergraduates have been part of my scholarship when I think of the people who worked on my digital edition with me last summer and other ways, right? This is, it's, it's part of my job makes my job better and makes me better at the other half of my job. Um, But I just want to flag that now being as many years out from undergrad as I am, I can look back at my friends who were English majors with me, and it's a minority of us who are professors or teachers. 
Mm-hmm. I have friends who are journalists, editors, administrators, and managers in fields like special education or diversity, equity, and inclusion. I have several friends who went to work in tech doing stuff with machine learning. Uh, and some of my friends went on to graduate and professional school. So there's people who are lawyers or librarians or MBAs now. Um, and really, the English degree gives you this opportunity to be excellent at analyzing ideas, excellent at communicating, and in command of your own ability to learn and master new knowledge. And I think that that's why I see so many of my friends going on to jobs where, you know, they're financially satisfied, but they're also intellectually fulfilled by their jobs. Um, And so for me, I think sometimes the, the fear that people have with the English major of saying, oh, well, then that means you you ha- must be a teacher or you have to want to be a teacher to pursue that field. That fails to perceive the breadth of things that people can and do do as English majors. I get the professor thing every single day. Because I have to, I'm a grad student. At the same time, I'm an undergrad student. So I have to get Uber rides every Monday. And I swear every Uber driver It's like, wait, you're going from one school to the other. And they're like, which one are you going to? I'm going to both. And they're like, oh, okay, so you're getting two degrees, both English related. You're going to be a professor. No, but thank you for for the guests. Thank you for asking, I guess. Yeah, and I think it's, you know, they they mean well, maybe, or they, at yeah. least they think, you know, that this is, that there is something you can do with it. So it's better than them saying you're going to do nothing <laughs> with that degree, right. um, which I suppose someone who's expecting a tip uh, is not going to say to you. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it, it's it's definitely, there. there is a way in which we we tell ourselves the narrative, right? Where narratives matter, right? We tell ourselves the narrative of of where our life is going. And it is really important to have some sense of that narrative because otherwise it's incredibly stressful to imagine, you know, going through all the effort of getting a degree and, and, you know, where is this going to lead? And and certainly parents and other people in our lives can put that pressure of saying, you need to know what's up. But I think that one of the challenges maybe when you're an English major is there's either one really obvious narrative or people say, well, I have no idea what you're going to do. You know, there's too many choices. So how are you going to make this work? But as as I look back from like the vantage point I have now, you know, everybody has found their way. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's nobody's doing a job that has nothing to do with the skills that they gained. Right. Like I'm, I'm pleased for so many of my friends to see, like they have jobs that are um, fulfilling to them and that are interesting to them. Boredom is a a tough thing um, to live with for the rest of your career. And, and, you know, the advantage uh, certainly of of my job is I am never bored. Um, And I think there are a lot of other jobs out there like that. And the English degree can be a key to finding something. Given the chance, would you go back and change your major or stay in the biology field if you could? Definitely not. So as much as I think biological science is cool, as much as I liked math, as much as I do love physics and I have a telescope in you know my closet, and as much as I love all of that, the real important thing for me in school was doing something that makes me feel fulfilled and trusting the job market to just be there. And that sounds kind of like an awful idea, but the reality is things are never as bad as they're painted when you're in high school and they're trying to push you into the STEM systems and things like that. Things, things are never as bad and bleak for the humanities as those like high school college counseling sessions would have you believe. And I was comfortable with the opportunities presented to me, even though I was extremely fortunate, but mainly I just enjoy reading and I just enjoy writing so much. And the professors at Widener, not to like make this an ad for Widener, but the professors at Widener were were exceptional. I remember so many of the books, so many of the essays, so many of the conversations in the in the English suite, and I don't think I would I, I don't think I would give that up. 
and totally on board with you there. I started out nursing and finished my entire first year nursing and then started sophomore year right off the bat English major. That's, um, that's effectively, yeah. that was similar to, so what happened was I was in the biology. I was coming from a community college. I was in, entering wider my sophomore year and I ended up having a, having an English class with a professor who was like, Hey, Josh, have you thought of doing theater at Widener? Um, You gave a really good speech earlier. And I was like, well, sure. And then I go and try out for that. And then her and the theater director also, they just kind of, you know, Hey, Josh, if you like books and English so much, why don't you just switch your major? And really sort of the validation from them and the support from them is what convinced me to make that switch by the end of uh, sophomore year. It um, brings up something Professor Esch said. Um, He was like, most of our students have a story about how they were poached from other fields by current English professors. And it totally holds true. I think that is true. And I think that's part of the, like those callous myths coming out of growing up where it's like, people tell you it's so bleak and then all it takes really is a few google sessions to learn that the humanities professions are growing at the same fair rate that a lot of stem fields are and as it turns out there's a lot of positions in this country and across the world where really the key thing you need to be able to do is communicate effectively (laughs) Are there any regrets, like, since you picked up the minor? Do you have any, like, doubts or regrets about doing it? Not at all. I think that I have signed better. I don't know. I don't want to sound too inflated, but I think I have signed better, and I'm writing way more, and I'm super happy. Because when I write a piece that I'm really proud of, I just want to, you know, read it to everyone. I wonder, what regrets or doubts did you experience, if any, when you were in college? Did you ever doubt your major? It started in high school, AP language <laughs> language courses because AP courses in high school aren't always taught the best in my personal opinion. Um, and I started to get really stressed and freaked out that I wasn't good at writing. And that gave me a lot of exa- anxiety in the first few years of college. But then it was always the semesters that I struggled the most. I did the best in. And I realized that's just how I work. I work really well under pressure. Uh, it's not the best way to live, but it works for me. <laughs> But I, I also, you know, I really like art. I like creating. I, like I said, I really got into theater at Widener. And I thought, well, I know I can't be an actor full time, but what about dramaturgy work or production work? What about more in that field? Could I do script writing? Could I do some more creative with that? Because I like being in that environment. And then I started to realize um, communications. Maybe I should have been a communications major. Uh, because I do like marketing and I like figuring out and analyzing social media and how we can use that. I, it turned out I can do that at my job now, even though I don't have as much technical training. But I did think about that for a while. Like, oh, maybe I should have gone into communications instead of English. But it all, like I said, it all kind of just worked out. <laughs> These are, it's all still a lot of similar skills working together. People always say it eventually works out. Mm-hmm. I think, I mean, this past year especially, once I started my new job, I stopped teaching. I thought about all the different paths my life could take, you know, depending on what decisions I made. And that's a very scary thought path to go down. Uh, but you have to just reason, well, if you're happy where you currently are, then it worked out. If you're not happy, we'll analyze why and figure out what you can do to change that, I guess, not to be too deep. Everyone in their life actually has multiple opportunities to reassess and redirect their career life, their intellectual life, their creative life. And there's a weird pressure that's put, in, that's put onto, um, you know, 18 to 22 year olds to figure it all out. And right now, and if you don't figure it out right now, you have somehow failed this you know, Sphinx question that you're being asked and your life is not going to work out for you. And, and that's so false, right? That it's in fact, you know, what has, what has evolved for me over the years that I've been sort of engaging with my education, engaging with my ideas and engaging with my writing 
is that I've moved through different disciplines and different modalities, but there, there emerges after a while a pattern. Um, and, and the pattern for me that I'm very comfortable with at this point is that, yes, literary approaches is, is the primary way that I want to engage with writing and with the world and, um, and with my career. And, and so I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to do it, you know, with you and your classmates um, here at Widener. But, but perhaps that people who are sitting where you're sitting right now shouldn't be putting as much pressure on themselves to have all the answers because you may feel like the one answer you have right now is the ultimate answer, but it's probably going to mutate a little bit and you'll get like the Delta variant of your answer in 15 years. Nice. (laughs) That's going to date this podcast. (laughs) Even I remember being in high school and you get the career counselor talking to you and they say uh, they stress the importance of English classes because people who are engineers or math people, they can't write because we don't always stress the importance of learning how to write and learning critical thinking skills. When I taught composition classes, the main thing I try to instill in my student was was learning critical thinking skills, uh, especially in the media classes. But all of the projects that we worked on, it's always looking at some topic, some subject, and just analyzing, thinking about working through different scenarios and different ways to look at something, which is so important. You need that different perspective in life and how you look at social events, yourself, your friends. You need to be able to have these skills just to look at things with a different perspective. And then you realize you can communicate in so many different ways, which I just think is pretty awesome. You kind of already delved into it. So if you're not down to keep talking about it, that's fine. But why are these myths not true? I will talk about that until the end of time, because as a high school teacher with students coming to me talking about how they love English and they're scared, I feel the need to be like, hey, look, it's an option. It is a viable option. Um, It hurts me when I see my students consider giving up their dreams. I don't like that. So I don't want anybody else to possibly make that mistake. At the end of the day, no matter how many engineers a company has, those engineers aren't going to be the people who are equipped with the practice of, you know, turning that into technical writing instruction booklets or successful marketing schemes, successful social media presence or uh, customer service or like discussions with other corporations. I kind of already alluded to this when I talked about the fact that I was in the fraternity, but that was sort of that validation that was like, wow, all of these people were making fun of my major choice, but at the end of the day, they're coming to me for review of the things that they're saying. Why wouldn't that also be reflected in the job market? And it kind of is, right? Like when I got my job at the law firm, he, I, he showed me the resume, like he showed me my resume and the thing that he had circled the most and underlined the most was English major. And the reality is an English major, just like so many other majors in college, equips you with a set of skills and each job in the market isn't something you can just magically walk into out of college, regardless of your degree. They all require their own training period. And so the way I've always looked at it is the job has its own training period. All they need to know is that you have prerequisite background knowledge and something that is important to them. And the English major gives you writing skills, communication skills, critical thinking skills, background knowledge on an entire, you know, if we're talking about the literary canon, background knowledge on effectively everything that fills pop culture, everything that fills conversations with other people, this major gets you that. Don't mind me. I'm just going to send this audio file to my mom really quick. <laughs> oh, no, abs- you know, like I will, I'll, I'll make the phone call myself. I will defend anybody who finds joy in this field. So Gabby, what did you learn after doing all these interviews, have the myths been debunked? I would say so. I think I knew they would have been debunked and I was prepared for that from the start, but I didn't realize just how successful each of these guests would really be. I mean, they, they blew my mind sort of, and they went above and beyond my expectations, which was really cool to see. 
Does it make you feel more comfortable about being an English major? I don't think I would have changed it, even if the myths proved to be true, because I love books and literature way too much. But yes, it does. It does make me feel better knowing that I'm a part of this awesome community. Absolutely. The English Suite is produced by Jim Esch and students at Widener University. Shpressa Imurai, Siana Bowers, Gabby Norris, and Chloe DeFlumery. You can find our podcast at anchor.fm and other major podcast directories. We would love to hear your feedback, announcements, and suggestions. Send an email to WidenerEnglishSuite at gmail.com. Thanks for listening.